my name is Colin Harmon. I'm a Pro Dean uh, Teaching and Learning in the Faculty and Head of the School of Economics. And it's a huge pleasure to welcome you all today for what is the kind of highlight, I think, of the TNL year from our point of view, which is our uh, Teaching Excellence Awards ceremony. Um, I'm going to pass the baton to, to our Dean in just a second, but just to give you some of the ground rules. Hoop, holler, have as much fun as you can. Um, it's meant to be a celebration of teaching, not meant to be a, a po-faced sort of uh, stay in the fair. So please uh, celebrate as loudly and as vocally as you want in the success of your friends, families, loved ones, etc. With all further ado, or no further ado, Barbara. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm Barbara Kane. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, and I would very much like to welcome you. Here today, I think before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Sydney is built, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to recognise also that this has been a place of learning and culture for many, many centuries. So I'd like to echo Colm to say it's a fantastic day. It's it's one. Of, it is not only the, 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 the sort of highlight of our teaching year; it's really the highlight of our year. And. Um, our core business, as we all know, is teaching, and ha having good teachers is the most important thing we can offer, really, to our students. So, our good teachers are an incredibly valuable part of our community, and in many cases, um, almost all of the teachers here today have been in some way or another nominated by their students. So, the sense, the, the sense that's really important is how highly valued they are, not only by us, but by the students whom they teach. And so to be here with them, their families, members of the academic community is absolutely fantastic. I must say, it does always remind me when I come to this ceremony of, of, of my own life. And I actually, I was a student here. Um, I won't tell you how many decades ago. And, um, and when, when I think about it, when I think about the sort of memorable teachers in my life, what's really notable about them is how different they were. I mean, one was a man who terrified me. He reduced me to absolute silence a man called Henry Mayer, who was a very kind of fierce um, a political scientist. And the other was a very courtly gentleman, Ernest Bramstead, both European emigres and refugees in the first, um, from the Second World War. And they had very, very different styles of teaching and elicited very, very different responses from their students. Bram Bramstead became my very dear friend. Mayer, um, I, I, I hid from whenever he came. But both of them elicited extraordinary effort from me. And I think that's one of the other things that's wonderful about good teachers. Um, so I wanted to make two points on that. One is, I think, that good teaching comes in many shapes, sizes and forms. And I think one of the exciting things about this, the people that we're going to see today and are going to do presentations is that recognition that we, 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 we come to about how many different ways there are for people to be good teachers. And we celebrate that variety. I said there was going to be two points, but I think that's the main point. Was about <laughs> but I think it's also a point about how very memorable um, important and influential teachers are in your life. They kind of stay with you in different sorts of ways. I hear them commenting in different sorts of ways many, many, many years after. So now I'll hand back to Colm and he's going to announce the names and I'm going to hand out the certificates which I signed laboriously. Good, good. Um, like kind of pardons, like a presidential pardon of some sort. So I'm glad to see the university was so like it is now in the late 90s, Barbara, when you were a student. Um, so, um, <laughs> we, have, we have sort of two sort of main groups to sort of celebrate today. One is uh, the, the academic staff in terms of teaching units and recognizing excellence in their teaching. But also, and we're going to kick off with this, the kind of really critical and amazing group of tutors who, who drive so much of the activity of the faculty. They're the sort of front line of who our students interact with, they're the people they relate to probably first more than anything else, they're the people who they share their problems with in the very early stages. So on that basis we'll kick off with the Dean's Citation for Excellence in Tutorial Awards uh, and the first is Adam Pio Varchi from Philosophy. Oscar fashion, um, um, we will uh, accept Adam's uh, citation on his behalf, and, uh, and that's all. Uh, second is Andrew McLaughlin from Sociology and Social Policy. I 
she said, please do come off using take photographs. Um, Brianne Fallon, Studies in Religion. Crystal Rome, French and Francophone Studies. <laughs> Emanuela Moretto, Italian Studies. Cynthia, Cynthia T.T. Wang from Economics. <laughs> Harry Johnson, Philosophy. Cheatham from Miko. <laughs> Julian Kwan from Economics. Macarena Ortez Jimenez from Spanish and Latin American Studies. <laughs> Meg Manke from Economics. <laughs> Natalie Pearson, Asian Studies Program. Sophia Brock from Sociology, Social Policy. There's always a group each year that gives the panel a particular challenge in, in the tutorial section for just really going um, quite above and beyond and uh, really making a huge difference to uh, the way uh, in what doctors are teaching, but the manner in which they interact more broadly with their school and the impact they're having across the board. 
So for that basis, the presentation of the Dean Citation for Excellence in Tutorials, with distinction, not, not high HD, but just a D, uh, is uh, Amelia Dale from English. David Primrose, Sociology and Social Policy. Spanish and Latin American students. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this batch, uh, Matthew Bulba, Economics. last time all of our tutorial winners. Um, next brings us to our Excellence in Teaching Awards and it's worth just reminding people you know, how people are going to be receiving these. This is where their peers, their students kind of really sort of push for a colleague for the contribution they've made, in the case of the students, the way in which they've influenced their direction of travel as a student, often in terms of their career. And it's that process that leads people to sort of reflect a little on, on their approach to teaching. So we're going to have a presentation. We're going to also have a short, very short, two-minute batch of kind of TED Talks, sort of, <laughs> from a bunch of people, which, you are, which are two minutes. You, at two minutes, you can start shouting and telling them to shut up uh, as a kind of a disciplinary device. Um, and uh, but we'll, we'll hopefully get some sort of quick insights. They get to do it while watching themselves on a screen here, which is very disconcerting, but uh, they'll see what I mean when they get up. Um, so the presentation of the Dean's Excellence in Teaching Awards uh, first goes to Associate Professor Andrew Waite, Economics. Modern Greek and Byzantine studies. Dr. 
Dr. Haley Fisher, economics. only never to be repeated in a tie, Dr. Kadir Hatalea comments. <laughs> Associate Professor Michael McDonnell, History. Peter Marks, English. <laughs> Dr. Rebecca Sheehan, U.S. Studies Center. Zoe Alderton for the writing room. some of our colleagues about uh, their teaching, how they were able to engage with and respond to effective evidence of effective student learning to successfully achieve excellence in learning. If I can't read it out, then um, they have a better job of proving their excellence in teaching by entertaining you in addressing the question. But the first to try and do so is Anthony. Anthony Brokopoulos. back to students what uh, once I was given by my teachers. But uh, where does one start? The first thing for me is to start from where the students are at. Uh, 
there's no student body for me. There is student bodies and student minds, and this has to be this has to be acknowledged and taken into consideration when you start a new class. So um, I think that each student brings a different world to the class, different experiences, different cultural backgrounds, different ways of uh, understanding, different perceptions, and somehow these have to be incorporated or uh, made functional within the framework where difference really is not an obstacle to learning but really adds new perspectives on seeing the things or the material that we present in class. Perhaps that's the first thing that really um, I place a lot of emphasis on when I come a new, across a new, uh, when I enter a new classroom. The second thing is how do you, if you, if you do that and you kind of create a, a steady framework of building a relationship with students, how do you maintain uh, the students engaged and interested in the, in the course. Well, I think that um, important to this is basically the, the idea that learning has to go back and connect to, to life. So I think that we should make an effort to really connect to our teaching back to students' experiences and lives. And how do we do that? By um, helping them to make the connection, by asking them to draw on their own experiences in order to solve problems, by uh, guiding them through a kind of uh, uh, dialectics of question and answer to realize themselves um, certain things which are important in their own lives and more importantly by helping them understand that um, really learning is a, a work in progress, a life process and important in this process is basically the idea that um, uh, one has to question one's um, certainties and um, I think that knowledge really relies on, on this particular premise, you know, questioning one's certainties and one's, uh, you know, perceptions of, of the universe. Self-reflection, I think it's, it's a very, very important consideration. Um, can I also add another point which relates to, to um, uh, assessment? I, th I love see assessment uh, relating to marks. Actually, actually, as a student, I never paid attention to marks up until the point that um, I had to apply for a, a scholarship and then I realized that, oh, maybe there is a role in uh, marks. Uh, assessment for me is a, is a way of offering um, back, um, giving to students some feedback. Uh, and I think this is, this is where basically the learning process or the, the learning that happens in a particular unit of study completes itself. Um, a, a course does not finish with a submission of uh, essays or with uh, the final exam. I think that the feedback by teachers, but also by students, uh, have developed in my class in my classes uh, a context where students are encouraged to offer, um, you know, positive or constructive, let's say, feedback to uh, people who present their work in class. And uh, the incentive for that is basically they get if they do if they contribute to to students. Um, uh, you know, constructively to the presentations, they get extra marks for their participation. Students so also can sort of give feedback, peer feedback, I think it's, it's a very, very significant. More or less, I think this uh, sort of gives an idea of how I approach teaching and how I approach the question that you raised before. But before I finish, I want to thank my colleagues for their support, the head of school, also um, the uh, members of the committee, and finally the students who take the time to provide feedback to what we're doing. Thank you. Um, Dermot McGuire, maybe you could do like this. Remember your job, by the way. Two minutes, start shouting. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have said that first. Thanks. Two Irish minutes. Yes. <laughs> That's like seven o'clock. <laughs> I'm from Northern Ireland. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I just watch it. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> you know you'd lose. Okay. Um, I um, first of all I. Um, I thought there was going to be a thing up here which was going to refer to uh, my teacher, which was Mr. Hank. It'll, it'll, it'll flash in front of you there. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, you won't see this then. <laughs> That's fine. Well, anyway, this, uh, 
this, this uh, particular thing gives away my age, let's say, that tells you that uh, I'm somewhat old. Uh, but I want to show to you that uh, this old dog has learned perhaps some new tricks. Uh, so in my seminar on par, I learned three new ideas which I've learned through classroom exercises ranging from uh, student videos to what is now called traditional forms of teaching. Uh, and I've been asked to sh share some of these uh, three ideas with you. And I sought to ensure some of the students uh, actually have read the articles or tutorials. And one of the things that my colleagues, this is one of the things that my colleagues complain most about, that is that students don't do the readings or tutorials. So what I had the students do was actually not do the readings uh, in the classroom exercise. They uh, played board games, they uh, <laughs> uh, read newspaper accounts, uh, they engaged in student-run student uh, student discussions, etc., etc. Et then they went into tutorials. They did the uh, they did the readings, and lo and behold, many of the things that they had discussed actually turned up in the readings. And therefore, they got a hunger, at least some of them, for doing the readings from there on in. Or at least that's what I've tried to con con kid myself a lot. <coughs> uh, so that was one of the first, I, th I think, uh, things that I came across that was exciting to me. Secondly, for the first time, I went to, I, I created uh, or used uh, student created videos on the theories of power. Now, the range of videos which were picked by the students themselves uh, included female lack of participation within tutorials, the political economy of make makeup, surveillance within a student dormitory, etc. In particular, this gave a boost to the performance of international non-speaking, uh, non-English speaking background students. And the use of images as well as a script allowed these students to excel. In turn, so I think that was a, that was a very exciting uh, thing for me in any way. Thirdly, uh, in terms of encouraging more female participation in the classroom, I asked female students uh, to develop a board game which was based on gender and power by filling in an em empty Monopoly board. The male students were not allowed to participate. <laughs> Last year, this gave rise to two male students walking out because they weren't allowed to speak. <laughs> One female student walked out because of my failure to control the situation. <laughs> it was truly a magical teaching experience. <laughs> and I really enjoyed teaching the students about gender and power that year. <laughs> I'd really like to thank the committee, uh, the students, Colin White for putting me forward, John Mickler and Rodney Smith for their support. Many thanks. And the, the Dublin accent is so much better, right? <laughs> um, hey. Ellie Fisher, come on. So one of the most exciting things about joining the School of Economics back five and a half years ago now was that we were just moving into the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences from the Business School. So it's been great to contribute to developing the teaching program to really align with that new position. Um, I've really enjoyed creating a course that looks at the economics of the family, so how we can look at how couples make decisions to show students that we can use the toolkit that we have in economics to look at 
decision making, not just in the business world, or not just in, in terms of interest rates, but also in terms of how they might interact with people on a day to day basis. So that's been incredibly rewarding for me. I sometimes say that as I've grown into teaching, one of the things I enjoy is spending time with people who are a lot younger than me. And it somehow makes me feel like I'm staying younger than I otherwise would. <laughs> but on reflection, I'm not sure that's so true, because actually what it often does is remind me just how much older than them I actually am. <laughs> Especially when I'm reaching for an example to use as something that people might buy, and the only thing that springs to mind is, you might buy a ringtone. <laughs> which apparently isn't done so much anymore. Um, but one of the ways I try to make sure that students stay engaged is by giving them some examples in exams, questions that are kind of framed in current events. So for example, uh, when I was setting a question to try and um, get students to say, well, how much would a lobby group invest in trying to influence a politician? They had to give their answer in terms of the number of bottles of 1959 range. <laughs> um, I've asked them to think about the value of their lives in terms of uh, amount of avocado on toast that they might eat. <laughs> um, but the most or probably least successful version of this was um, last Wednesday evening when my students sat down to answer a question about how a character named Donald might choose how much tax to evade. <laughs> so, my efforts and engagement there may well have caused some kind of traumatic experiences for some, uh, but at least I'm, I'm current in some way. <laughs> so I'd just like to thank um, the school, the committee, and those who uh, put me forward for this award. It's a great honour to be here. Thank you. Great. And just to indulge me for a second, other than I think the interview panel, uh, the first people I met when I came to Sydney was Haley and Kadir, and uh, they are the reason I came here, in fact. Uh, they're just amazing people uh, to be around and to be head of school for. Um, Michael McDonald, over to you. Thanks very much, Colm, and thank you uh, all for coming out tonight. Um, gosh, it's wonderful, uh, it's humbling. Thank you to Tanya and the committee. Uh, to the faculty and Barbara uh, for the award, um, and all the other inspiring teachers and tutors who really uh, push us, uh, always push us. It's, a, it's an honor to be in such company. Uh, it's a privilege to be in such company. And I feel particularly sheepish, I think, to be up here, especially on my own receiving an award, because as all good teachers know, effective teaching is really a collaborative venture. Uh, and this course that I've received the award for in particular was a one big collaboration from uh, planning to execution um, with colleagues involved in thinking about it, with uh, community partners that we eventually, that the students eventually worked with, uh, people like Beck Plum who helped us figure out how to, to, how to work a blog site, uh, helped me how to work out a blog site, uh, also lecturers and tutors. And especially Michaela Cameron, who's here, and uh, Michaela, you should just, just uh, say hello. Uh, <laughs> Michaela's a brilliant PhD uh, student. Michaela's a brilliant PhD student who, uh, unfortunately, uh, gave a guest lecture in this unit rather than a, a rather than was a tutor. Uh, otherwise, no doubt, she'd be winning a tutoring award, I think, for, uh, for her efforts and her, her thoughts about the course. But especially as well, it's a collaboration with our students, and I think that's really vital to keep in mind. Um, and in this case, especially with a pioneering group of students in the class who were willing to take a chance with me when I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, it was a, what I come to call a community-engaged public history course. And I've done, had done little public history, little community history, uh, little Australian history. Uh, I do early American history. So it was a big gamble. Um, it grew out of our social inclusion program in which we reach out to disadvantaged high schools around Sydney and in the regions. And teachers of those students kept telling us we need to take our students out of their bubble in Granville or Liverpool or Parramatta, uh, you know, bring them down to the university. Uh, show them a different world, but we used our 
wonderful history students as volunteers on that program. And it suddenly became clear to me that we also need to get our students and ourselves out of our bubble, out of the bubble that's the university, that's the eastern suburbs, the northern beaches, northern suburbs. So I created a course, we created a course, a few of us uh, talked a lot about it, that really asked a lot of students, asked them to reach out to community or local organizations, to work with them, to volunteer their services, volunteer some work for them. I called it background reading. Uh, you know, and I tried to sort of pin this to all our other pedagogical kind of uh, uh, markers. To reach out to those community and local organizations, to work with them, and to create something entirely new and really unknown with them. Something hopefully useful to someone else other than themselves. Okay? And as I said, I had no idea what we were going to end up with at the, at the end of the unit. Because I said to them, look, I'm keen to, to, to push you guys, I'm keen to, to get you to think about alternative formats, not the traditional essay. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, so they had to create something entirely new. It was a public history project based on that engagement with no limits in terms of the format and the presentation. But I have to say the students rose to the challenge. They did some amazing work with some amazing organizations all around Sydney and in the regions. With the Redfern Legal Center, with the Scone Civic Theater Restoration Project, with the No West Connex, uh project with the Hurlston Wanderers Football Club and they worked with those organizations and they worked hard. They told me at the end of the unit and through the unit, they would complain quite a lot, that they never, <laughs> in a good way, never worked so hard for a, for a history unit or any other course because they felt responsible, responsible to that organization they were working with to come up with something wonderful. Uh, and they did. They came up with all kinds of podcasts, uh, audio cast, someone wrote a, a, a screenplay, um, another student uh, wrote a historical recipe book that she, <laughs> she's published subsequently. Most of them are still in touch, or I shouldn't say most, many of them are still in touch with the organizations that they work with. And they really learned, I think, they suddenly felt history in a different way, or, or experienced history in a different way. They experienced it as something bigger than just getting marks, and a few of them put that down in their evaluations and in the blogs that they wrote that are now up on the university uh, blog site, um, and really realized that history was also a lifelong process that they could be engaged with uh, outside of their degree. So, I'll cut it, I, I'm going to, sorry. <laughs> hey, cool. Where is the cane? <laughs> hey, cool. what, did, it, what did I learn? All I learned, I think, apart from Bad timekeeping. <laughs> Sorry. Was that I think we need to trust our students. We need to trust our students and we need to think, we need to help them, let them push us. They're the future. They're the ones that are going to be creating history, making history in the future. We, all we need to do is just stand back a little bit and let them help unleash that creativity. Because I think we have some of the most wonderfully creative and dedicated students in the world. I think we need to capitalize on that. Great, and, and by the power of my watch, I hear that Ariadne is live tweeting. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to finish with Rebecca. Thank you. you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, first, the thank yous to my colleagues at David Smith, the amazing David Smith, to my beautiful family who are here. Thank you so much to the community and to my amazing students. I wanted to um, just play you a little bit of, well, first of all, I should say, I teach a class called Sex, Race and Rock in the USA. And for me, the core things about the class, it's about history, it's about identity, and it's about social justice. What I want the students to understand is that identity is something that is manufactured in a historical context. It's something that is, that is not fixed or natural, but something that can change over time. I also want to give them an experience of joy within the university <coughs> to give them a sense that learning is both serious and emotional and happy. And one of the weeks that we do on disco, if we do a week on disco, students are always very sceptical about disco in advance. <laughs> So you know this song, right? <laughs> so that, 
Yeah. So that song, <laughs> Le Freak, by Nile Rogers and, and his band Chic. So in the week on disco, we read an article by, uh, from Nile Rogers' memoir, in which he talks, he, he makes the claim that disco was as much, if not more, of a revolution for people of colour and queer people than the 1960s were. And I say to my students in tutorials, what do you think about this? And they say, yeah, we want to believe him, but not really. <laughs> and I say to them, but imagine what it would be like to be, to have a history of being enslaved, where your body is enslaved, and for the first time in your life, you feel like you can be free on the dance floor. And they say, yeah, that's really nice too, but not really. And I say to them, well, I'll tell you something right now. If we went out of this classroom and did some disco steps, I can guarantee you'll probably forget most of what we discussed in this class, but you'll never forget that we did that. And they said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so on the last day of semester, Dario Phillips, who brought street dance and hip hop dancing to Australia in 1981, an African American man from Ohio, came to give the second half of the guest lecture, or second half of the final lecture and we went out just outside the Darlington Centre and after he talked a little bit about it, he showed us a few moves, including the electric slide. <laughs> and I got more emails from students after that last lecture <laughs> than I have for the whole five years that I've been teaching the course. <laughs> and I usually get a lot of emails from students, so the final thing to say would be, I think now is a more important time than ever to be talking about identity and what it means in the world but it's also a more important time than ever to bring joy into education and learning. Thank yeah. you. Um, absolutely perfect ending, although I was terrified you were going to reveal Nile Rogers' other revelation about freak out. It was no. meant to be the okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've, we've reached the end of, we really, of the formal proceedings. I don't think so maybe get everybody just one last time, uh, cheer all of our recipients, all of our speakers, and give them a vote of thanks. Thank you so much. I want to say a few things, really just, uh, to, there's a kind of a cast of thousands that lie behind uh, the TNL team. Um, uh, the educational designer team that you all interact with and, and know and love and respect and rely on. Um, uh, Brian Bailey and the T Teaching and Technology Innovation Group. Um, uh, James Kern is somewhere here. Uh, James and I always joke about the, the other joke from the office that there's a deputy director or there's a deputy to the director. So, yeah, there was a deputy pro dean or deputy to the pro dean. But James was very much deputy pro dean. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's my last kind of stint, uh, swan song as pro dean, so it's been a really enjoyable two and a bit years. Uh, but in a sense, the person standing there probably captures uh, most of what uh, the TNL team is represented by. Tanya is somebody who sort of plugs into all of your lives and careers and student life in so many ways. So we'll just end by just thanking her and uh, the small presentation.